Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this webinar will be uh, recorded. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, long-term extreme response analysis of cable-supported bridges with floating uh, pylons subjected to wind and wave loads. Uh, the presenter today is uh, Yu Wang Shu from uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So uh, with that, I uh, leave it all up to you, Yu Wang. Okay. Thank you, Matthias, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yuan Xu and uh, from uh, NTU, and uh, today I'm uh, going to present uh, the work I did about uh, the long-term extreme response analysis of the suspension bridge with uh, floating pylons subjected uh, to wind and wave loads. And this work is uh, supervised by uh, Ula Iset. And uh, the time domain analysis and uh, long-term uh, extreme uh, load effects are the keywords of my research. The reason to do the to do the time domain analysis is uh, to learn the effect uh, of nonlinearities because it's uh, very long and the cylinder structures. And uh, nonlinearities, uh, there are different kinds of them, and so have, such as uh, geometric nonlinearity due to a large deformation, nonlinear wind and wave forces, and nonlinear dampings, and so on. One of the challenges uh, here is uh, to model the frequency dependent terms, uh, the frequency dependent aerodynamic uh, self excited forces, and uh, hydrodynamic uh, radiation forces in the time domain. The long-term extreme response is uh, to predict uh, the extreme response value or the maximum uh, response value of the bridge that can occur in a very long period, for example, in 100 years or in 10,000 years. Uh, they are very important uh, for the safety design of very large structures. Uh, so far, there are a lot of available methods to do such a long-term analysis. Uh, my work is focused is uh, focused uh, focused on the uh, looking for some uh, computational efficient way to do this because uh, time domain analysis requires uh, a lot of uh, simulation time. So the computational efficiency is very important uh, for the case study. Uh, there are uh, here I I put some uh, solutions uh, for crossing the fields with uh, large widths and depths, and uh, the curved floating bridge, the floating tunnel, and uh, the suspension bridge with uh, the floating pylons. And my research is about uh, this uh, the last uh, concept of bridge, and the bridge is uh, supported uh, by two fixed pylons and two floating pylons. Here are the four objectives I listed here. The first one is to get a better understanding of the dynamic behavior of this new concept uh, bridge. And uh, the second one is uh, to propose a time domain method uh, to simulate uh, the wind and the wave loading effects. And the third one is uh, to find a computationally efficient way to uh, study the long-term uh, extreme load effects. And the uh, last one is uh, about uh, machine learning approaches in the analysis of long-term extreme load effects. Uh, so far, the machine learning approaches has uh, been popularly applied in the structural reliability, reliability analysis. And uh, many research has uh, shown that this method has a had uh, advantage in and computational efficiency because it uh, doesn't require a lot of uh, cases for training. So you don't need to simulate uh, many cases uh, if you use the machine learning methods. And uh, here is the research plan I made at uh, the start of my PhD study. Uh, most of uh, the topics related uh, to my research are here. For example, the wind actions, uh, the wave actions, the structural dynamic analysis, and the long-term extreme load effects analysis. We start with uh, the time domain modeling of the aerodynamic uh, uh, load effects. 
and uh, we use the Hardanger bridge as the case study. And then this uh, method is generalized uh, in step two by involving both aerodynamic force and uh, hydrodynamic uh, force. And we use uh, the suspension bridge with fluid pylons uh, as the case study. And this method, this uh, method is uh, is finally used for the long-term extreme analysis in step in step uh, three by using some uh, conventional uh, reliability analysis method. And in step four, we applied the machine learning methods, and then we compared its performance with the, the conventional approaches which has uh, been introduced in step three. So we start with uh, the dynamic behavior analysis of the wind and the wave induced load effect. In the simulation, you can use either frequency domain method or time domain method. In frequency domain method, there are also mode by mode method and also multi mode method. Uh, the mode by mode method uh, ignores the aerodynamic coupling among different uh, natural modes. So we used uh, the second one, the multi-mode method in our case. And here it shows how to, uh, how to run the multi-mode method in MATLAB. And uh, basically there are four, mainly four steps and I have uh, marked by different colors. The first uh, step is uh, to do the model analysis in stereo air. And uh, we can export uh, the, uh, the files uh, uh, natural mode shapes, and uh, they are used for the generalized coordinate. And step two is uh, to, to achieve the aerodynamic uh, damping and uh, stiffness metrics from uh, wind tunnel experiment uh, or from some uh, CFD simulations. BQ is the static wind force uh, coefficient. And, uh, used, and then we can calculate uh, this uh, matrix is in the uh, generalize the coordinate, just doing some integration using the natural mode shapes. And uh, the third step is uh, about uh, the hydrodynamics. We calculated uh, the added mass, added uh, damping, and uh, the first and second order wave force transfer functions uh, based on uh, potential theory. Uh, here we use the hydro D in the case in the case studies, and then we can calculate uh, this uh, matrix in the generalized coordinate and also a generalized uh, spectra of the wave 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 excitations. And then finally we have the uh, the matrix, the mass damping and the stiffness matrix for the coupled uh, structural error and hydro system. And then we also have the uh, wind and the wave load uh, actions, uh, actions. So we can calculate uh, very easily the uh, response in generalized coordinates. And also we can transform it uh, to the physical coordinate. And this is uh, the multi-mode frequency domain method. Uh, in the time domain method, you can you can solve it by using the convolution integral. So you can also uh, using the state space method, and uh, the state space method has uh, some advantage in the computational efficiency. So we used uh, this method in our case, and uh, this is a motion equation of the floating structures. Uh, MCK are the structural mass damping and stiffness. The M hydro and C hydro are the hydrodynamic added mass and added damping. CAE and KAE are the aerodynamic uh, surface added uh, damping and uh, stiffness. These uh, four terms are, relate, are dependent on the oscill oscillation frequency of the structures. So in the time domain, we have to transform these uh, four terms uh, to time domain. Uh, we start with uh, the transformation of the aerodynamic uh, self-excited forces. 
Here the GQ is uh, the aerodynamic surface and forces uh, in the Frick's domain. We can firstly apply the inverse free transform and uh, it can be uh, expressed uh, uh, as a convolution integral. And uh, we as mentioned, uh, we used the state space model to replace uh, the convolution integral. And finally, the surface set is a nodal force. The finite element model can be expressed uh, as the summation of these three terms. The A, Y, two are constant matrix, and the F, R is uh, expressed by a state space model. And also A, B, C are also constant matrix. So the problem now is uh, to determine these uh, five constant matrix. Uh, they can be achieved by correlating the aerodynamic derivatives. And my colleague uh, Bartos Jago conducted uh, the wind tunnel uh, experiment of the Hardanger Bridge section model. The section model is forced to oscillate uh, in the vertical, lateral, and the torsional directions uh, harmonically. And in this way, we can obtain the 18 aerodynamic uh, derivatives as a function of the reduced wind velocities. And the re reduced wind velocity is defined as the uh, mean wind velocity divided by the width of the of the girder and uh, the frequency of the oscillations. And we can correlate uh, these uh, scattered uh, aerodynamic derivatives to a uh, uh, rational function uh, here by using some uh, nonlinear least square method. So we correlating, we will get uh, the uh, unknowns uh, with the A1, A2, AL plus 3, and uh, DL uh, in the expression of rational functions. And uh, this, uh, the capital A1, A2, ABC, these constant matrix addressed functions of this uh, low case, uh, low, low case A1, A2, AL plus 3 and DL. So now is the uh, transforming the hydrodynamic uh, surface set forces. So it's very similar and it can also be expressed uh, by the state space uh, model. And here the inf infinite here is uh, the added mass at the infinite uh, oscillation frequency. And FR is uh, expressed by this uh, state space model. And uh, the matrix AH, BH, CH are also constant matrix, and they can be obtained by correlating the uh, added mass and the uh, added damping. Here, the figure, if you can see the blue points, they are the added mass and damping uh, calculated uh, based on potential theory. And the red, uh, the red curve here are the rational function curves. So the correlate uh, is uh, it's very it's very good and. Uh, through this uh, correlating, we can get uh, the parameters P and Q in the expression of the rational functions here. And uh, the matrix A1, A, H, B, H, C, H, I just mentioned is just uh, some uh, combinations of the parameters P and Q. So finally, we transformed uh, these uh, four frequency-dependent terms uh, to five time-dependent terms. And then we can solve this uh, time-dependent uh, motion equation and get the response in the time domain. And uh, here is how I implemented this method in Abacus, because we cannot uh, solve this equation by ourselves. It's uh, too complicated. Uh, if you can, we did it in Abacus by defining some uh, user element by using some user subroutine. And if you can see some red crosses uh, in this uh, figure, the red crosses uh, on the girder are the error user element. And uh, the red crosses on the TRP is uh, the hydro user element. And these uh, five terms are defined as uh, properties of this uh, user element. And then they can be used uh, to simulate uh, the force induced uh, by the motion of the structures. Uh, the A1 and uh, A2 are defined as the stiffness and damping matrix of the error user element. 
and FR is uh, defined in the residual force of the user element. And uh, A infinity is defined as the mass matrix of the hydro user element. Now we can do some simulations and uh, calculate the response of the bridge in the time domain. And also the user element method can, is also very convenient to simulate some nonlinear drag dampings. Uh, to validate uh, the accuracy of the time domain method I just uh, presented, we firstly compared the flutter analysis results based on frequency domain and the time domain method. In linear system, uh, there's uh, no nonlinear effect. The results based on these two methods should be exactly the same. The flow chart here uh, in the left shows the basic idea of looking for the critical mean wind velocity based on frequency domain method. There are mainly two loops uh, in the flow chart. One is the natural frequency and uh, the other one is the mean wind velocity. And uh, the stability of the system can be studied by considering the real part of the eigenvalues. A positive uh, real part refers to a, an unstable system. And the model damping can also be calculated using the eigenvalues. And I plot uh, the model damping of the first uh, lateral and the vertical and torsional mode. And you can see as the mean when the velocity increases to about uh, 78 uh, meters per second, the model damping for the torsional mode uh, becomes zero. And uh, the start, if you, if you go keep increasing the wind velocity, the structure will have some negative damping and it will become uh, unstable. So the 78 meters per second is uh, the critical mean wind velocity based on frequency domain method. And uh, the, the critical velocity can also be found uh, from time domain method and it's uh, easier to understand because uh, you just uh, need uh, to give the bridge uh, an initial displacement or initial acceleration and then let it go. It's, if the response decays to zero, it means that uh, the bridge is stable. If the response goes, uh, goes diverging, it means uh, the system is unstable. So we, here we plot uh, the vertical response and the torsional response of the girdle at middle span and uh, three different uh, mean wind velocities. Uh, if you say the red curve is the wind velocity equal to 40 meters per second, you can see that the response uh, decays uh, to zero. And uh, as the wind velocity is 80 meters per second, the response uh, goes diverging, it becomes larger and larger, and uh, it will never stop. And uh, as the wind velocity is 78.3 meters per second, the response always uh, almost keeps constant. It means uh, the structure has uh, zero damping. And uh, this is uh, the critical wind velocity based on, based on time domain method. And it is very close to the results uh, in frequency domain analysis. Uh, we can also do the validation test uh, by comparing the dynamic response of the bridge and the stochastic wind and wave loadings. Uh, here is the wind spectra we used in the validation test. And we plot uh, the average spectra of the 20 generalized uh, realizations. And it corresponds very well with the target uh, wind spectra of the wind velocities. And uh, we did the simulations under this condition, the mean wind velocity equal to 40 meters per second. And we compared uh, the spectra of the displacement of the girder at the middle span. And uh, from here, you can see that uh, the response based on time domain and the flux domain method uh, corresponds uh, very well. And also we did uh, the validation test in the case study of the floating suspension bridge. And we used the same wind spectra in the Hardinger bridge case. 
and uh, the PM spectrum is uh, used uh, to generate uh, the wave field. And also it shows uh, how to calculate uh, the time series of the first and the second order wave excitation forces. Here I plotted uh, the auto spectral density of the wind force on one spine and the wave force on one TRP. And uh, the dashed line are the target uh, spectral density. The solid line are the uh, average spectral density for 10 realizations. And uh, the wind force and uh, the second order difference frequency force are very small compared to the first order wave force. So here we multiply the zero spectra by 100 and 1000 uh, respectively. And from the comparisons, we can see that uh, the wind force and the first, uh, and the wind force and the second order difference frequency force are dominating in the frequency range from 0 to 0 0.3 radius per second. And uh, there are three modes, three natural, the first three natural modes are located uh, in this range. So it uh, makes the wind force are very important uh, for the dynamic behavior of the system. And uh, the first order wave excitation force uh, dominate uh, in the frequency range from about 0 0.3 to 1.2 radius per second. It can it uh, can excite uh, some uh, higher order modes of the girder, which will be very important uh, for the section forces uh, in the in the girder. And we did uh, some uh, simulations under these uh, environment conditions. And here is the uh, standard deviation of the displacement uh, in the lateral direction, vertical, and torsional directions. And uh, the dashed line are the five time domain simulations. The red solid line is the average of these five simulations. And uh, the blue line is based on Frick's domain method. If you compare the blue and the red solid lines, they correspond very well. We also compared uh, the displacement of the of the balance, and also there exists a very small difference between time domain and the frequency domain analysis. So through this validation test, we can prove that our uh, state space time domain method are very reliable and uh, very accurate. After uh, the validation test uh, in the linear system. Uh, we include uh, the nonlinear effect uh, in the time domain analysis. Here is a section moment uh, along the girder, the standard deviation of the section moment. And we have results based on the linear analysis, uh, the analysis considering geometry nonlinearity, and uh, the analysis considering both geometry nonlinearity and the nonlinear buffeting force. And it turns out that uh, the geometry nonlinearity has uh, almost uh, no effect. And the nonlinear buffeting force makes uh, some difference on the standard deviation of the vertical bending moment and the torsional moment, but uh, not very significant uh, difference. And we also compared the contribution of the wind and the wave actions uh, to the dynamic behavior of the bridge. Uh, three cases are simulated uh, here. The black uh, line shows the response and only wind forces. The red line shows the response and wind force and first order wave force. The blue line shows uh, the response and wind force, first and second order wave force. It's very obvious that uh, the wind uh, dominates, the wind force dominates the lateral and the vertical displacement, as well as the vertical uh, bending moment along the girder. Although the first order wave force has very few contributions to the uh, lateral displacement, but uh, it uh, still dominates the lateral bending moment uh, along the girder. And this is because it can accept uh, some uh, uh, higher order natural mode and this is important for the section forces. And if you compare the, the red curve and uh, the blue curve, they are almost uh, coincide with each other, which means that uh, in this case, 
the second order will force uh, has no effect. And here it shows the standardization of the section forces on the girder and the different, uh, different wheel heights and different uh, mean wind velocities. Uh, for the, uh, the section moment uh, increases uh, monotonically with the wheel height. But uh, the variation, uh, variation of the section forces with the uh, mean wind velocity is a uh, little different. You can see in some cases with very large we will hide. Uh, the section force is always decreases first uh, when the wind velocity increases. And this is uh, due to the aerodynamic damping. It also increases with uh, mean wind velocities. Uh, the second part is about uh, the long-term uh, extreme load effects analysis. In the short-term analysis, the extreme value can be analyzed according to the time series, time history of the loading effects in a very short-term period. Uh, for wind load effects analysis, the short-term period is uh, is uh, usually taken as 10 minutes. And for wave load effects, uh, the period is uh, three hours. For combined wind and wave load effects, the short-term period is usually taken as uh, one hour. In the long-term analysis, uh, uh, the, uh, the long-term period are usually uh, decomposed to many, many short-term uh, uh, short uh, period. So we can calculate the long-term uh, extreme value distribution by by calculating by integrating all uh, by integrating all short term extreme uh, value distribution uh, as the expression here here the low case f is the joint uh, distribution of the environmental conditions and here we have the mean wind velocity the significant uh, wave height and the peak wave period and uh, the Capital FX is a conditional distribution of the short-term extreme uh, extreme values and the corresponding environment conditions. And we do the integration, we will get uh, the long-term extreme value distribution. This uh, full long-term method is uh, the most accurate way to do the long-term analysis, but uh, it requires a lot of computational time. Uh, take uh, our case example, if we have three parameters and it uh, requires us to uh, simulate the case to uh, about uh, 4,800 uh, cases. If we can solve this uh, about 5,000 cases in the Frank's domain, it uh, requires maybe only several hours. But if you are going to solve it in the time domain, it uh, could take more than one year. So it's impossible to apply to use uh, the full long-term method if you want uh, to consider the nonlinear effect. So here we studied, uh, in the research we studied the three approximated way to do the long-term analysis. The simplified for long-term method, and the inverse first order reliability method, and the environment contour method. Uh, in the in the full long-term method, it uh, considers all possible short-term uh, environment conditions. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, not all the conditions has a contribution to the extreme value distribution. It is therefore necessary to assess which condition has significant contribution and which should be, should be just uh, disregarded. And this is uh, the expression of long-term mainstream uh, distribution for a stationary system, for a stationary process. And we used uh, this term to represent uh, the contribution of an environment condition to the long-term mainstream load effects. The mu x here is the average up-crossing rate. 
And uh, it turns out that only the condition in a very small, if you can see the control plot, there is a only the conditions, uh, there are only conditions in a very small area has the contributions to the long-term extreme values. And we compared uh, the simplified frontal method and the full frontal method. In the simplified method, we used uh, the wind velocity from 25 to 35 meters per second, the wave height from seven, from three to seven meters, and uh, the uh, wave period from uh, seven to 10 seconds. And the conclusion is that uh, the simplified method can predict uh, equally accurate uh, extreme values when using approximately 10 times less computational time. But uh, the number of uh, conditions required is still very large. So uh, the simplified method is uh, not uh, a good way in our case. And uh, the I form the inverse first order reliability method is one of the most uh, computational efficient way to do reliability analysis. Before introducing the F form, uh, I will explain what is the form first. Uh, here we defined uh, a limit state function, and uh, S critical is a critical defined by a user by the user, and S D is the uh, long term extreme uh, long term extreme values. And uh, the failure is uh, defined uh, when the critical value as critic is exceeded by the extreme uh, value xd. So the failure region is uh, is uh, equal to when g the limit function smaller than zero. So the failure probability is uh, expressed as the integration of the uh, in this uh, equation. The GX uh, smaller than zero is a failure region, and uh, FS is the joint distribution of the environment condition, and FXD is a conditional distribution of the short term extreme uh, responses. Uh, some researchers propose uh, to transform these uh, distributions to a space constituted uh, by some uh, normal variables uh, following normal distribution. Here is the U1, U2, other other variables following normal distribution, and the phi is the CDF of a normal distribution. And the advantage of transforming the distribution from the physical space to the U space is that uh, in the U space, the variables U1, U2 are are, are independent, and uh, the integrant. Uh, in the failure probability can be expressed uh, in a more, sim more simple expression. And uh, so far, the, this uh, expression of uh, failure probability totally has uh, no loss of uh, accuracy. To make this uh, integration uh, easier to evaluate, we can also do some uh, approximation in the integration boundary. So in the form, it uh, assumes uh, it uh, assumes the linear approximation. But uh, to minimize the accuracy loss, it's uh, natural to expand uh, the limit uh, state function at uh, the point uh, that has the highest uh, contribution to the probability probability integration. In other words, we want. Uh, we want uh, this term, uh, we want the integrant uh, term to be uh, to be the uh, to be the largest. So it's uh, equal to find the minimum distance uh, uh, from the, so it's equal to find this um, the minimum terms of this term. And this term is equal to the distance from the original point uh, to the design point. And by doing some uh, derivation, the failure probability can be expressed as the phi minus beta. Uh, in the in the form, we the as the value of x critic uh, is uh, given, 
and the, the job is to calculate the failure probability. In the I form, the failure probability is given, and uh, the purpose is to calculate uh, the critical value. For example, if you want to calculate the response which occurs once in 100 years, the failure probability would be equal to 1 divided by 100 year multiplied by the number of hours in one year. And here we used uh, the short term period to be one hour. And if we apply the failure probability, substitute the probability to the conclusions uh, from form, we can get uh, the beta, the value of beta. So we now we know the the distance from the design point uh, to the original point is a fixed value. So the so the design points must if we if we, uh, if we consider a case with two random uh, environmental variables, the design point must be on the sphere with the radius of beta. Here you want you two other normal variables transform the from the distribution of the environmental variables and the use rate correspond to the, the z axis use rate corresponds to the short term extreme response distribution. And so the problem is to look for the point on the sphere which can give the maximum extreme uh, values of the response. And the proof and uh, the flow chart here shows the iterations uh, to search for the design point on the sphere. And we applied it uh, in our case and uh, the design case number nine uh, is uh, found uh, after eight uh, iterations. And the extreme response values is compared with that based on full long term method. And uh, there exists only 2.2% difference. So that form is a promising uh, way for our case in doing some long-term analysis. And another approximate approach is the environmental contour method. We still use the problem with uh, the two environmental parameters as an example. In the form, the variability of the short-term extreme value is considered, which is uh, represented by the use rate. In the environment control method, the use rate is set uh, to be zero. In this way, the environment contour line is only related with the U1 and the U2, as presented by the red circles in this U space. And uh, if we transform this uh, circle from the U space to the physical space, the environmental contour line corresponding to one year, 100 year, and uh, 10,000 years will be like this. You can get any years you want. And the cases on the on the line which gives the largest response. You can you can sim uh, you can simulate all the cases on the contour line. And the one gives the largest response is considered as the design case. Uh, in our case, we have three environmental parameters: uh, the mean wind velocity, the wave height, and the peak wave period. So the environment contour surface for 100 year return period is like this. And we did all the simulations based uh, on, the, on the contour surface based on Fuchs domain method. And we found that uh, the red point here, on the, uh, here and uh, it, it gave me the largest uh, structural response. As we just introduced now the environment contour method neglects, it, it sets the use rate to be zero. So it neglects the variability of the short term extreme values. And it can lead to some non conservative results. Here we compared the results from uh, environment contour method and full long term method. So it's, uh, it's very small. It's still very far away from the exact value. So one way to compensate uh, the inaccuracy is to introduce uh, a correction factor. Although this factor is uh, dependent on what kind of structures in your case, uh, many studies show that this uh, factor has some similarities. It's always in the range from 1.1 to 1.3, 1 
when calculating the 100 year return load effects. And also in some Norwegian standard, they also suggest to use a value between 1.1 to 1.3. And we also checked the correct uh, correction factor in our case. It's the value in the full long-term method divided by the value from environmental contour method. And it's uh, 1.12 is also in this range. Uh, the results uh, were simplified for long term. The environment control measure, the I form I just presented, are all based on frequency domain analysis. Uh, here we analyzed uh, the nonlinear effect uh, on the extreme values. And as the figure shows uh, the time history of the vertical bending moments and the 100 year return condition in linear and nonlinear analysis. And there are some obvious differences uh, at the peak uh, peak values of the response. And uh, we know that uh, the extreme response are mainly related with these peak values. So the nonlinear effect could have, uh, could be more important uh, in the uh, extreme uh, responses than that uh, the effect in the sand deviations. And here we, Plot the CDF of the short term extreme uh, bending moments in linear and nonlinear analysis and compare uh, them. And if you compare the black and the blue solid line, and uh, they are linear and nonlinear analysis results uh, respectively. There are about 20% uh, difference uh, for the media extreme section moment. So it would be better to include a nonlinear effect in the long-term extreme load effects analysis. But if we use time domain analysis to consider this nonlinear effect, it will be very time consuming to do the simulations, even when you use the approximated approaches. So we proposed to run the F-form based on combined time and frank domain results. This is the iteration that was showed based on Fruits domain results. And uh, we can see that uh, in, from the right figure, we can see that most of the iterations are concentrated in a very small area. Inspired by this, we divide the whole space to two parts, the time domain region and the Fruits domain region. And during each iteration, we will check where is the iteration point if it is in the first domain region, we will, use, we will just use the first domain results to continue this uh, iteration. Due to that, the uh, time domain region only constitutes a very small percent of the whole space. Uh, a lot of computational time can be saved. So to make a conclusion of the second part, uh, you have to say that uh, the simplified long term is not, uh, not uh, recommended. Uh, the form, the I form, based on combined frequency and time domain results is more recommended uh, for our case. And, uh, the last part is about uh, machine learning. Uh, we touched upon some machine learning method in the long-term extreme load effect analysis, the artificial neural network and uh, support uh, vector machine. Uh, there are a lot of machine learning codes available online, so we don't uh, need to compare the code by ourselves. We just uh, need to learn how to use it. And we applied uh, the measures on both Hardinger bridge case and uh, suspension bridge case, and the uh, suspension bridge with uh, fluid impediment case. Uh, here is the artificial neural network. It is uh, comprised uh, of three layers the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. The hidden layer can have one layer or two or even more. It uh, depends on how complex uh, your case is. And in our case, we just use uh, one hidden layer. And each layer has uh, several elements. Uh, they are called uh, the neurons. The number of neurons in the input layer is equal to the number of uh, random variables in your case. The number of neurons in the output layer is equal to the number of the output variables in your case. The hidden layer can has can have as many as as many neurons as you want, but uh, it's not uh, the more the better. 
if you, are, you there are too many neurons, uh, it will introduce some more overfitting problem. The layers are connected uh, by the weight and bears parameters. As the uh, input uh, layer receives uh, training data, the values in the neurons in the hidden layer can be calculated using the transfer functions. Here we use the F to refer to the transfer functions, and omega B are the weight and bias parameters, and XJ is the uh, uh, is the values uh, trans transmitted from the input layer. And uh, there are different uh, kinds of uh, trans functions like linear function, unit step function, or sigmoidal function. The output uh, of the neurons in the output layer can also be calculated in a similar way. And the difference between and the output value and the target value can be used as a criteria and judge whether the network has been trained uh, well or not. Here the T uh, in the difference, in the expression of the difference, the error, the T is the output value from the output layer and the Y is the target value. If the difference between the output value and target value are not uh, very large, the information of this difference were transmitted back and the weight parameter and uh, the best parameter will be optimized and updated again and again until you get, get some uh, satisfying um, difference between the output and the target value. There are also many optimization methods uh, to, to do the training, to do the training work. For example, the gradient descent methods, RM method, and the Beyonce regularization method. When you determine the structure of your network, you also need to find out what's your training data in your case. Let's take the floating suspension bridge as an uh, example. Uh, we have four random variables. It means that we have four neurons in the input layer. The X1, X2, X3 are the environmental parameters. Uh, the mean velocity, wave height, wave period. X4 is the probability of the short-term extreme response. And the target is is the values of the short-term extreme response. So you can generate maybe 100 training cases and train this neural network. And you, and uh, then you can use the Monte Carlo simulation. You can generate uh, millions of the uh, of the case and use the network to calculate the output for the millions of uh, input and you can calculate uh, the failure probability based on the Monte Carlo simulation. And here is the support weight machine. It's, it is firstly proposed uh, to do some classifications. Uh, there are two kinds of points here. Uh, the Y and the minus one the support weight machine can find the optimal hyperplane between these uh, two categories. Uh, now it also can solve some regression problem. It's very straightforward to use it in the reliability analysis. If we divide all our case, all our simulated data to two, two, two categories, one is the safety, where the limit state function is larger than zero, and the other is the failure, defined by the when the function is smaller than zero. And the hub prime found by the support of the machine is then the failure surface. By combining it with the Monte Carlo simulation, we can achieve the failure probability. And uh, here we sh here is the uh, application of machine learning methods uh, application to the Hardanger bridge case. Uh, we still use the vertical bending moment uh, in the GERDA as an example, and uh, we assign a value to the x critical and uh, plot the limit function when it is equal to zero. Here we consider the variability of the mean wind velocity and uh, the turbulence intensity. U1, U2, the, X, the X axis and the Y axis, U1, U2 are transformed from the distribution of the mean wind velocity and the turbulence intensity. And Z axis, U3 is transformed from the conditional distribution of the short-term extreme response. In the figures, the yellow surface is the exact, uh, exact uh, limit uh, state function. 
the blue circles are the surface determined by form, SOM, and uh, machine learning methods. And uh, in this case, the state limit state function is not very nonlinear. So you can see that you can use first order and second order approximation. Also, uh, they're, they also match very, very good. But if you look at surface determined by spot waked machine and artificial neural network, they are much better. And also here is the case. You can see the case required. And uh, the, the machine learning method using the only 30 cases, which is even less than the cases used in the form. So in this case, the machine learning has much better performance uh, than the traditional conventional approaches. And also here is the case uh, we applied uh, in the Hardinger, in the floating suspension branch case. And the x axis u2 and the y axis u3 correspond to the uh, distribution of wave height and the peak wave period. And u4 related to the short term extreme many moment because it's hard to plot a full dimensional figure. So the values of the mean wind velocity u1 is uh, fixed. And uh, when we and in this case, the limit state function is very nonlinear, and uh, clearly the first order expansion is insufficient uh, to demonstrate the true failure surface. And uh, second order expansion is much better, but uh, still not good enough. The last figure shows the limit state function determined by using an um, artificial neural network, and it uses a simulation of the dynamic response under 70. Uh, 73 environmental conditions, which is even less than that used uh, in the form, but it gives much better results. And you can also compare the performance of this method from the failure probability. And uh, still, the artificial neural network, artificial neural network uses the least uh, computational time and yields the best results. So it's uh, so it's very recommended uh, to apply it uh, in our case study. So let's to make conclusion of the presented work. Uh, firstly, I applied a time domain method in Abacus by defining a use element uh, in order to simulate the wind and wave actions. And its accuracy is validated in both flutter and buffeting analysis. Secondly, we found a computational efficient way to uh, predict uh, the long-term extreme load effect is that form based on combined time and frequency domain results. And the last one touched upon the machine learning methods and applied in our case to do the long-term analysis. And uh, the artificial neural network shows very good performance both in the computational efficiency and the computational accuracy. Yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you so much for a uh, very nice presentation, Yu Wang. Uh, I think I'll um, open up to questions if I, anyone uh, has any questions for Yu Wang. Uh, hi, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm uh, I, I'm uh, interested in uh, hearing about uh, what kind of uh, wave loads have you uh, included in the analysis you have done. Yeah, what can do? Yeah, uh, you just applied uh, the first and second order wave excitation forces. Uh, yeah. So by, uh, by second order, what uh, does it mean? The second order difference frequency force and uh, some frequency force. And um, from your point of view, what is the uh, level of, uh, how do say, importance for the difference and some some frequency loads? What's what? What's the... well, uh, which is more uh, important? Uh both of them are not important. Mm. Because uh, because. Uh, we also have wind uh, forces, and uh, the wind force it also has uh, where it's also the energy of wind is also located in the low frequency range. Mm. 
So the second order will second order difference free force is much smaller than the wind force. So it's uh, not uh, important anymore for this bridge compared to the wind force. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, is it is this um, general conclusion or is a more uh, case specific uh, conclusion? Uh, case specific. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's just the for 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 this uh, one case. Yeah. And also, it's suggested to do some different combinations of wave height and wave period. Yeah. So uh, so uh, your target uh, bridge here is for the Bionafun, right? Ah uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. So, but your your method uh, you have developed the method can include both uh, the low frequency wave loads and the high frequency wave loads, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, another question is about I saw that uh, you have shown a panel model of the for calculating the wave loads. The the panel model, the hydrodynamic model. And I, I, I'm just interested to say, uh, what, how, is it faster to calculate that in hydro D? Um, it's, uh, fa it's very fast uh, to calculate uh, the first order force, but so when you calculate the second, uh, it's uh, yeah. super slow. Yeah, that's super slow. <laughs> uh, yeah, it takes one week maybe. Yes, OK. Yeah. Or even more. Yeah, thank you. We still have time for uh, some more questions. If anyone uh, have more questions for uh, Yu Wang. Hi, Matthias. Uh, this is Mitya Papinuti. I would have one question for our presenter. Yeah. Um, so my question was, um, you mentioned shortly uh, also the effects of uh, viscous drag damping yeah. uh, on the submerged uh, elements of the bridge. Yeah. Um, so I believe this was not um, a focus here uh, in this research, but uh, can you uh, maybe a little bit explain? Uh, do you have some experience on uh, what are those effects uh, on the bridges? Uh, how do they participate to the um, uh, global response? Uh, are they important or maybe they're not so important? Um, what is your experience on this? Uh... I didn't do many simulations, but uh, I have some uh, worries, maybe just a uh, little experience. And uh, I think the viscous drag damping is uh, very important because at, uh, the low, because at the low frequency range, there are very few damping from the aerodynamic damping or, hy or hydrodynamic damping. So in the very low frequency range, there are with cross damping will dominate uh, the total damping of these structures. So it uh, will have some uh, very, it will have some effect uh, for the first, for the, to reduce the response at some uh, lower mode, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lower order natural mode. Exactly. As, as you mentioned, this is a lower order is, uh, uh, motion is more or less introduced by the wind, and then you come to a waves which are a bit higher frequency ranges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you for a uh, great presentation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If there are no uh, further questions, I think I'll once again uh, thank you, Yu Wang, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I hope uh, the rest of you uh, enjoyed it. And um, I will now uh, stop the recording. <laughs>